All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left to Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal We are joined today by Professor Cheryl Cashin the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice at Georgetown Law. She's the author of several books, The Failures of Integration, How Race and Class Are Undermining the American Dream, 2005. The Agitator's Daughter, A Memoir of Four Generations of One Extraordinary African-American Family, 2008. Place, Not Race, A New Vision of Opportunity in America, published by Beacon in 2014 followed by Loving, Interracial Intimacy in America and the Threat to White Supremacy, also published by Beacon in 2017. She joins us today to talk about her most recent book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding in the Age of Inequality, published by Beacon in 2021. Of White Space, Black Hood, Heather McGee writes, we need Cheryl Cashin's scholarship to make sense of the racial inequalities that mar every urban community. And we need her vision to guide us to a more equal society, illuminating, compassionate, and engrossing an instant classic. Thanks for joining us today, Professor Cashin. Thank you for having me, Dr. Neal. I'm so honored to be with you. So tell me a little bit about your journey to this book. Oh, okay. The short version of it is I was, I'm the child of, of activists who spent their waking hours agitating to make things better for dirt poor black people in the black belt of Alabama, mm -hmm. or, you know, the, uh, my mother was a deputy director of a community action agency and she served poor people and she treated them with the utmost respect. They were her clients. They were deserving of respect and, and dignity. And I was inculcated in me. Um, for some reason I'm, you know, ever since I, I I I went to law school, you know, I wrote my uh, you have to do an upper class paper in law school. My 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 third year research paper, I wrote it about zoning and and exclusion mm -hmm. in Yonkers, and then I worked in the Clinton White House, uh, and you know, I would see all these vast amounts of money going, particularly transportation dollars, going into majority white spaces, and we would have these little relatively tiny initiatives for renewing uh, disadvantaged spaces. And I just got obsessed with it. So, um, and, you know, when I became a law professor, all of my academic work was about why we have you know, such grossly unequal places and spaces, you know, that everybody operates within and understands, you know, don't go there. Right. <laughs> we try to get my kids over here. Right. But we just take it for granted. And so um, that's that's my journey. And I, I the more I, I've spent. Uh, well, I should say I'm a self-taught historian with a degree in electrical engineering you know, <laughs> and a law degree. And I, I just have for two decades, I've been studying this stuff and I wanted to share with readers what I learned. And the more I learned, the angrier I got. Mm. Um, um, and so this is really a, a, an act of love for people trapped in the hood. You know, I, yeah. I, I call them descendants and I, you know, I advocate for them with everything I got in this book. You begin the book talking about Black Baltimore and you know, we, we often think of Baltimore now as kind of a second city, almost a third city in some cases. Um, but as you remind readers, you know, Baltimore was home to the largest population of free Blacks prior to the Civil War. And, and some of that energy obviously informs the way Black Baltimoreans thought about themselves in the post-Civil War era. But you also say that because of this kind of spirit of aspiration, for lack of a better way to describe it, um, you know, Baltimore becomes also a site of, you know, the first incidences of racial zoning. Um, and, and then, of course, becomes part of this whole conversation around uh, restrictive covenants. Um, talk a little bit about that history in relationship to Baltimore. Right. So Baltimore is a, a, a fairly extreme, not well, it's an extreme example of what happened everywhere large mm -hmm. numbers of black people landed particularly the great migrants 
Um, uh, but yes, you had a large number of black people. And in the 1910s, you know, 1890s, black people could go shop where they wanted. They could try on the clothes. Um, but uh, in the 1910s, 19 teens, um, we have a lot of nasty racism heating up. It had been there before, but you also had ideas. I'm forgetting the word. What's the word? Uh, eugenics, right? right? You had these right. ideas um, percolating uh, in the country. And for some reason, a um, very well-educated lawyer trying to buy a house on the nicest street in Baltimore uh, upset people. And that was the beginning of the effort at racial zoning, right? Um, and so they start with racial, they start with, with racially restrictive covenants. Baltimore was actually not as violent as other places, but the great migrants were contained wherever they went through right. violence, racially restrictive covenants, um, racial zoning until the Supreme Court struck that down and then exclusionary zoning. Right. And then uh, wherever black people were contained, including in Baltimore, which is East and West Baltimore, the their neighborhoods were redlined, marked D, hazardous, um, black people, despite living in some very vital areas, um, uh, particularly vital entertainment districts, mm -hmm. um, uh, their neighborhoods were marked unworthy of uh, the federally insured mortgage. And immediately, um, these neighborhoods started to decline. Um, and Baltimore has that legacy. If you Google redlining, name your city, Baltimore, you can see the maps from the 1930s. And virtually the same neighborhoods, eight decades on, a Fed study shows that the decision to mark them as hazardous correlates today, presently with decline, disinvestment, segregation. So that's the legacy. And then the government piles on. Right. Um, cumulative blunt, blunt force trauma visited it on the people of the descendants in East West Baltimore. You get um, urban renewal, tearing through um, black neighborhoods to move them away from downtown. Um, you get uh, highways intentionally mowing through again, uh, majority black neighborhoods, we get the highway to nowhere. So mm -hmm. you know, mowing the, the, the uh, highways through to make it easier for whites to get to the suburbs. Right. Um, and, and, and then you get uh, public housing, the people who are displaced, thousands of black families are displaced. Where are they moved? Um, in Baltimore and a lot of other cities, they get moved into public housing assigned intentionally on a racial, racially discriminatory basis. So black projects for black people, right? right. And then, so overnight, you're, 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 what happens when a policy requires that 100% of the people in, in, a, in a development have to be poor, right? right? Overnight, you create an intensity of poverty that didn't exist. So these federal policies created the ghetto, right? And that that exacerbates anti-Black feeling, which was already there. So it's like this vicious circle. All of the major federal policies um, of the 20th century did damage to Black yeah. people in Baltimore. And again, everywhere you have um, um, stark segregation. And I tell this, and then I move all the way forward to show how the disinvestment continues. Yeah, you know, it's you mentioned transportation earlier, and uh, I, I was just thinking about the fact that you know the few days before we record this, Larry Hogan had decided that he wasn't going to run for president, and and he had emerged as kind of a, a friendly face of the Republican Party in comparison to Donald Trump. Uh, but when you reflect upon some of the decisions he makes in terms of transportation policies, um, particularly with the red line, right, which if it had right. been fully developed, would have allowed access for black folks to be more mobile, to be able to get to jobs, to work and what have you. And, and even in the context of him being a friendly counterpart to Donald Trump, he still is an agent 
of folks you know, who already have are very, very well resourced in the context of thinking about just transportation in this case in the state of Maryland and a city like Baltimore. Governor Larry Hogan's announcement not to fund the red line light rail is drawing some harsh criticism. I don't even know where to start with my frustration. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake says she's frustrated because the 14 mile transit system was a step in the right direction for Baltimore, providing underserved communities better access to transportation. They depend on their public officials working with them to support them so they can get the jobs and get to work. Instead, the Hogan administration has shut that door and really basically just, you know, pretended that Baltimore doesn't exist in a state of Maryland. Absolutely. I mean, his rescinding of the red line project was what really motivated me to, to write that first chapter about Baltimore. Mm. I was so upset about it. Um, so the, this plan, this red line had been on the book since 1965, right? <laughs> it was going to connect the poorest neighborhoods in East West Baltimore to the job centers in the suburbs and downtown. Right. And um, it took a long time to finally get a coalition politics that supported um, unifying the city through transit, right? And it actually took a New Starts grant from a Black president's administration, the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. You know, basically they said, here's $900 million to support this thing. And it, that helped get the politics in the state legislature. They matched it with, you know, twice that money. They had done all the planning, you know, 15 years of planning, coalition building, in, in inviting the citizens in the low-income neighborhoods to reimagine what their cities would be like and mm -hmm. connect people to construction jobs. It was going to be a beautiful renewal, right? Within months of Hogan coming into office, he rescinded the red line program. And right around the time that Freddie Gray was murdered, um, and he reallocated 100% of the money for the first stage of construction to road projects in outlying majority white suburban areas. The red line would have extended from Johns Hopkins Bayview in the east and Woodlawn to the west. Hogan's administration says spending $1 billion to build an underground tunnel through parts of downtown partly killed the plan. Baltimore County leaders say they're hoping Hogan can provide an alternative plan. Not, not one pothole in, in Baltimore was filled with that money, right? I mean, it was, and he called it a wasteful boondoggle, right? You know, meanwhile, people lecture to the people in the hood to say, get a job, but many of the people in those neighborhoods are carless and can't right. get to the jobs are. Right. Right? So he calls that a wasteful boondoggle, but he lets the Purple Line go forward. The Purple Line project in Prince George's and Montgomery County is an innovative approach to alleviating congestion in the Washington suburbs. This 16-mile light rail line will extend between Bethesda in Montgomery County to New Carrollton in Prince George's County. It'll provide a direct connection to the Metro Rail red, green, and orange lines at Bethesda, Silver Spring, College Park, and New Carrollton. The right. purple line that was going to serve relatively affluent Washington, Maryland, Washington, su suburbs of Washington, D.C., right? So that's a classic example of what I call opportunity hoarding. Um, in our public policies, state, federal, local, uh, we tend to overinvest and exclude in affluent white space, and we tend to disinvest, contain, and frankly, prey on people in the hood. And that's what I illuminate throughout the book. Yeah. One of the things you talk about is the deployment of, of ghetto mythologies that stick to our sense of who Black people are in the hood and, and why they need to be contained, right? You talk about anti-Black stereotypes. And, and so could you talk a little bit about that history? I know you begin um, that chapter talking about Ronald Reagan and his deployment of the ghetto of the uh, welfare queen, okay. right, right, in 1976. Um, but could you talk a little bit of how these function and, and also the kind of unspoken complicity of often Black popular culture Right. To reinforce these narratives about, you know, the pathology that exists in the hood. Right. So it's really important to understand that um, American politics has always been, at least what is it 
relates to Black people and institutions that suppress them has always been a cultural project, right? There's some uh, anti-Black stereotype that's part of the rhetoric and the politics to justify the, the, the institution, whether it's slavery, Jim Crow, or the iconic ghetto, right? Um, and that's part of the politics and the language to support the policy. And people who benefit from the institution, in this case, extreme residential segregation, uh, get con conscripted into those stereotypes, right? They get invested in them because they benefit from them, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, we've had, let's see, Ronald Reagan, 1980, what is that? Four, we're come, 50 years, 50 yeah. years of anti-Black stereotypes that drive, you know, uh, you know, from the from Richard Nixon Law and Order mm -hmm. to you know Ronald Reagan Welfare Queen War on to, Drugs <laughs> you know the War on Drugs to Thug right um, I mean the anti blackness and anti black stereotypes were cynically part of the Republican Party's um, strategy to 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 propagate anti tax. Um, fanaticism, right? So it wasn't even, it wasn't just the war on drugs. They didn't stop there. It, the, those racial codings about government, you know, perfected the idea that all, all government was a handout and we should have, we should just shrink it and, and, and have low taxes, right? Um, government in the back of people's minds is for those people, right? right so right. it's really quite sinister. Um, and depressing in terms of how effective it has been, you know, uh, and we have, it's, it's recurring now, like, you know, crime, it's always crime, 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 law and order, we're right back there. Um, and so this anti-Black stereotypes are part of what makes it so difficult to address problems, right, right? To, to, to reimagine society. And what I try to underscore for readers and, and hopefully, you know, whoever's watching this is that um, while anti-Black stereotypes were key to constructing this extreme architecture of segregation, uh, everybody's harmed by it, right? The only yeah. people who really benefit from the way things are organized now are the relatively small number of people who can afford to buy their way into the highest opportunity neighborhoods, right? right? Everybody else is getting a very different deal. You know, my students and your students have come out of institutions laden with debt. You know, it's far beyond their ability to buy a single family mm -hmm. house with a pick mm -hmm. fence. But in most cities in this country, it's illegal to build anything other than a single family house on something like three quarters of the land, right? So we've ordered society for, for a really small uh, segment of elites, um, but anti-Blackness and these stereotypes, you know, are, are what supports exclusionary zoning. Yeah, you know, when you think about that, um, I, I, I go back to the transportation example again, um, you know, because so much of this, in many ways, is about a fear of Black mobility, right? Literal mobility and, of course, social mobility. And the stories that you hear about, you know, projected, whether it was the red line or the fear of a bus line, you know, coming to a particular neighborhood, because if the bus line shows up, the kind of people who ride buses will show up also, right? There's right. a quote that you mentioned I forget what city it was, and and the legislature said something along the lines. Well, you know, they're going to take. Oh, it's actually Maryland, right? Um, a run, a run day, a Rundle Farms or, or that area. And and you mentioned that, you know, one of the legislatures is like, well, they're going to take the bus line or the rail line. They're going to steal our, our TVs. <laughs> right, right, right. And part of the reason why it took so long to get the red line approved is, I mean, the politics. They called it loot rail. It was light rail. It was called loot rail. You know, people would call them loot you, you know. Um, <laughs> but they had no problem building a beautiful light rail that connected the northern affluent suburbs to right. that beautiful, is it Candlestick Park? Or I can't remember the name, but the beautiful park for uh, uh, and stadiums they've Camden built. Camden Yards, yeah. yeah. Camden <laughs> Yards, right, right, right. Um, One of the things you also talk about in relationship to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, is this issue of surveillance. Um, and, and we we have always understood the impulse for the anti-Blackness 
of policing in the U.S. Um, but there also seems to be something more sinister, right? Because because what you lay out and what we understand is that this is a process of surveillance, right? And it's as much about containing people as it is extracting information <laughs> about right. the kinds of folks who are living in Black communities and to get a better sense of how Black folks are moving and thus need to be contained, you know, in the future. Right. So I say that we have a system of residential caste. We pre-civil rights America was the caste system was just based on race. Okay. Right. Post-civil rights revolution, we have a caste system that's based on where you live, your race, and your socioeconomic status. And I say there's three pillars to it. One mm -hmm. is boundary maintenance. We have policies to keep those boundaries that were constructed. And right. we invest in reaffirm. Second is opportunity hoarding, which is you know what the overinvestment and disinvestment patterns. And then the third leg is stereotype-driven surveillance. And a lot of the surveillance happens at boundaries where <laughs> whites and blacks are. They could be right across the street with each uh, from each other, right? Um, where you know there's a uh, white space or white people to protect. A lot of um, surveillance also happens in gentrifying areas, but but the sociologists, and I quote them all, the sociologists mm -hmm. who have been writing about concentrated Black poverty, you know, they call it a system of social control, social containment, right? Mm -hmm. So the kind of policing that goes on in high poverty Black neighborhoods it's militarized. Uh, there's a lens. Every young man is presumed a thug, presumed a threat. They're treated as such. It's a kind of policing that would not be tolerated mm -hmm, by mm -hmm. citizens of any color in affluent spaces, right? Um, so they live in a police state, right? But when, even when they leave their hood, right? Or, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've encountered some kind of surveillance in your life as a black man, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> I'm certain you have, right? But, um, you know, so they're surveilled, black bodies are surveilled heavily in the hood by police, but um, black bodies are surveilled heavily all over the place. And these are the videos, right? I right, opened right. The, with, the, you know, the bird watcher, the Harvard educated right. bird watcher, you know? Um, and then there's a whole ecosystem now with, with cameras and ring doorbells and, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, um, too many people don't have the cultural dexterity to experience a dark complected body without a knee jerk reaction, doing utterly ordinary things, you know, so I have a, a entire uh, chapter about it as the mother of fraternal twin black boys are 16 or past the cute stage now and taller than me and getting hair on their face. Um, right. It's going to happen. Right, right. Uh, the subtitle of your book is Opportunity Hoarding in the Age of Inequality. Um, and it's such a fascinating way to think about what's happening. Can you talk a little bit more about this concept of opportunity hoarding, particularly as it might apply to K through 12 schooling? Okay. So in K through 12 schooling, um, in pub, I'm just, just sit with public school for now, yep, right? Of course. Uh, in this country, I cite this study which found that every year um, we spend $23 billion more in majority white public school districts than majority minority districts with that educate the same number of children, $23 billion more um, in state and local resources. A lot of that has to do with, um, you know, somebody decided, I'm, I, I really need to learn the history of it, but somebody decided schools should be financed largely but through the property tax, which obviously right. Right. when you have extreme disparities in property tax well, it's gonna lead to savage inequality, right? Um, uh, and even in those states that have had lawsuits, almost every state has, you know, you go all the way up to the Supreme state Supreme Court, most state constitutions have an education clause that requires, uh, you know, as a social contract, all children right. are supposed to get a good education. Even when they get some state Supreme Court rulings, 
um, in the state legislature, uh, the outcome of most legislative policy debates tends to favor the desires of middle and upper middle class suburban interests, right? And they resist it, right? They resist using tax dollars raised through income taxes to um, equalize or, right. or make it right. yeah, it's, right. it's a very difficult politics. So, you know, segregation alters politics. It puts affluent and non-affluent places in direct horizontal competition for limited resources, right? Um, you know, but even apart from, from um, where race is clear, where the preferences of white citizens get 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 um, um, attention, one thing that blew my mind that I cite in the book is in, in Baltimore, going back to that example, which has had um, a series of black mayors is a mm -hmm. majority black city with majority black representation on the city council. Um, they found because of the work of a, of a black scholar, Lawrence Brown at Morgan State, um, he presented them with data to show, do y'all realize you're spending four times as much money in white neighborhoods as black neighborhoods with your community development dollars, right? They're, they, they didn't realize it, right? And this, right. so, you know, we just have habits of preferencing um, the, the needs and desires of affluent places, even though those places actually are cross-subsidized by other places. Uh, it's really, really deep. But because of the exposure this issue is getting, you now have a, a counter movement, a racial equity movement, where a number of places, including Baltimore, a number of progressive cities are now building racial equity into their budgeting. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to that. Yeah. Do you think that'll be ultimately successful? Okay, well, I'm gonna stick with Baltimore. So they did get um, this, this major piece of legislation through, um, even they, and it passed over Governor Hogan's veto, uh, veto, you know, we got a black mm -hmm. governor in Maryland now, which is <laughs> very exciting, right? Um, but it's a, a the, it's called the Kirwan plan, but a plan for like $4 billion in new investment in education, right? There is the potential for a better politics as a lot of places now, um, black and brown kids children of color are majorities in public schooling. And employers um, have a vested interest in making sure that that's a well-educated populace, right? Right, right. right. So um, there's more of a chance in, certainly in so-called blue states or, you know, purple states to get a coalition around this idea of, of equity, fairness. We have got to figure it figure out how to educate all children well. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but it, it, it is a tough, it is a tough politics because we have such long held habits of, right. of overvaluing the desires of some people and denigrating others. Again, part of that rhetoric, but when do you hear black people refer to as citizens, right? right. You know, when do you hear, uh, and, and, all people basically, particularly parents, want the exact same things, right? right? You ask them what they want. They, you know, um, they want a lot, the exact same things. But we just need to learn to value um, the desires of of, of, of black and uh, and brown citizens. And what I say in my final chapter, which is abolition and repair, yeah, repair. is the yeah. title. I say the first step to transformation is that we need to change the lens that we apply to descendants from presumed thug to presumed citizen. And once you um, are able to see low-income Black people in their neighborhoods as three-dimensional human beings, mm -hmm. as citizens, capable and, and as assets, as a, mm -hmm. and capable of agency in their own transformation, it frees you up to focus on evidence-based strategies that have uh, improved outcomes, right? Um, and I give some examples, you know, universal basic income pilots, um, uh, the peacemaker fellowships that Rich Richmond, California innovated, mm -hmm. making bus routes from the poorest neighborhoods free, 
about, you know, a couple of dozen right. cities now doing that, but trying to create an opportunity society rather than, you know, this attitude of containment and fear. Yeah, you mentioned the need to shift from a, a culture that's punitive in relationship to to the descendants and to one that is caring. Do you think there is an impulse politically in this country to make that kind of shift, right? To recognize more fully the humanity of Black folks? I would like to believe that, you know, in the summer of 2020, no police, no justice, no peace. 26 million people participated in about 2,500 nonviolent protests raising signs saying Black Lives Matter. And I still see the signs. They're still in my neighborhood. I still see them, you know, in certain businesses and things like that. Despite the backlash, I, I would like to believe that. Um, I, I, I think that there is, uh, dare I say it, you know, a, a uh, maybe a, I shouldn't say silent majority because that was the conservative. But I think there's a majority of people in this country, it may not be a definitive majority, but it's a majority. Um, they want something better than yeah. a society that's premised. This is Bell Hooks um, analysis: a society that's premised on violence. Right? You know, this this arch segregation requires violence to maintain it. Right? Right. Um, right. You know, and I say, what if we flipped it? You know, my students hate it when I invoke bell hooks and say, you know, what if we tried to 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 to, to uh, order a society based on love? And they just like don't want to hear it, right? <laughs> I said, what about just care, just care, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's just I, all these social experiments, um, which I, I I'm writing more and more about. When you bring a lens of care, it really makes brings out very different policies. For example. Right. Um, even police unions, some of them are starting to say, you know, we don't want to be the, the first responder to a mental health crisis. Right. Some of them are right. starting to say that now. Right? OK, so if you bring a little bit of care, you know, if, if 40 percent of the calls to police is really about some person in distress. Right. Why? Why shouldn't we reallocate some right. of right. the police budget to a different type of first responder that's actually trained in that and brings a right. lens of care to this distressed person and, and, you know, and tries to diffuse it rather than, you know, sending people who are trained to deal with violent criminal threats, you know, and may have PTSD themselves, you know. Um, right. So a lens of care, um, I, I do think that in progressive cities that are not hampered by a hostile legislature. Legislature, right. You know, there's a lot of innovation going on and I've, I've written about it and it gives me some hope, right? Um, we need, you know, we need to just keep trying. What's next for you, Professor Cashin? Okay, so <laughs> I'm afraid I may jinx it by talking about it aloud, but you know, I, I ended my book with abolition and repair mm -hmm. and uh, I have been steeped in reading about abolitionism from the, you know, from the colonial era forward. And I, I have gotten approval to teach a new seminar, Abolition and the Law, where I'm really showing the role of, of abolitionist thought in um, uh, attacking slavery, forced labor, prisons, and... Mm -hmm policing. And I'm thinking about, I'm using that. So I always use my seminars as to German for a little while. So what I really, what I really want to do is just write a, 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 a essay kind of book where I held up my favorite radical abolitionist. Mm. Right. And I'm, I, I'm in communication with a, with a publisher about it, but I shouldn't say anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> we will look, hope, you know, cause often I'll say, Often when I'm depressed, I say, well, what would Fred? I call him Fred. <laughs> oh, Fred right. and son. You know, he right. had to do it much worse. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll be able to have you back on when you're done with that project. Oh, I would We'd love, love to talk to you. We've been joined today by Professor Cheryl Cashin.
Carmack Waterhouse, Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice at Georgetown Law. She's a author of several books, including The Agitator's Daughter, a memoir of four generations of one extraordinary African-American family, and most recently, White Space Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding in the Age of Inequality, published by Beacon Press in 2021. Thank you for joining us today, Professor. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back, black.